All right, this is Event Trader on here, and we got the latest edition of the Sentiment and Flow Show, and we are about to be joined by Brett Manning, a.k.a. Chart Trader, of course. Brett, you with us? Sure am, Gav. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. A little annoyed of getting shaken out of my NQ short here, so I think that might be a good place to start in terms of some of the action that we're seeing today, and then we'll roll into what we've been seeing in the sentiment data and some of the flow data. But um, you got any thoughts on this action intraday? Well, I mean, you, you've got uh, what I think is more or less a, um, a short-term bullish consolidation over the last seven days or so. Uh, we've seen a kind of flag pattern. Um, and when you get to the point where maybe you're ready to start climbing back up, you know, shakeouts are going to be thick on the ground, and, and you know, I get tagged by them all the time. We all do. And um, really, it's just, you know, it's just sometimes you barely don't get tagged, and sometimes you barely do get tagged, and today you barely got tagged. I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> but, you know, you can look back at a million million examples where I remember there was a crude oil trade I had a couple of years ago that was the perfect ever example of this. I moved my stop up after getting into the money, and it shook back out and got literally within one tick of my stop and then took off for a big move, and I moved my stop up again later after taking some profits, and it did the exact same thing again on the same trade. It didn't tag me two different times by one tick and ended up being one of my biggest trades of the year. And I, I always think about that trade when I when I think, oh, gosh, I just got one ticked out of a position that then ends up working. And you just have to remember that, you know, it happens both ways. And the memory kind of you, – you, you remember the ones where you barely got stopped out a little bit more than you remember the ones where you barely didn't. But the universe isn't out to get you. For anybody out there listening, the universe is not out to get you, I promise you. I, I, I remember um, in 2016 leaving for the holidays, and I had a short on in the markets, and I literally got ticked out by one stroke, and that was um, that year when uh, we just had that big heavy selling in January, and I missed oh, out yeah. on like a 200-point trade. So yeah. I, I, I know it goes both ways, but it feels like it goes more against me that often than not. <laughs> but I promise you, Gav, the universe is not – you live in a friendly universe. Wasn't that Einstein who said everybody needs to arrive at the point in their life when they realize they live in a friendly universe? So, <laughs> yep. So, smart guy. So, so, I mean, basically, um, you know, we're talking a little bit here about strong activity on uh, the bullish side and a little bit of shakeouts going on here and there. So I think when we go through some of the data that we're seeing out there, um, you, you know, we'll see a few things that are, sh are that are reflective in this action that we're just talking about, and a couple of ways to think about it, and some of the things that we're looking to do in terms of trading and everything. But uh, first place I want to start off with you, Brett. I think it's one of the more interesting aspects, and that's that option speculation index uh, from Sentiment Trader that moved up to 130. Recall last week when we were talking about this it was right around 120. And uh, basically what that means is there's 30% more volume on bullish options than there are on bearish options. Kind of harkens back to what you were talking about, Brett, with the reasoning for putting this on. Just some people that are afraid of missing the upswing, portfolio managers yeah. that are protecting against that. Um, I think they've gotten cash out of the market, and now they're looking for a hedge against the possibility that we head into a blow-off move to the upside. That's what I think that really represents. Yeah, one of the interesting aspects about this option speculation index, and I want to know your thoughts on this. Whenever I mention it to Scott, I know he gets upset with me, but uh, it's hit 130 18 times. And in that time, 17 of them, the S&P suffered a negative return from two to eight weeks later. Uh, the one uh, in 2010 was the only exception. Uh, and that one's gains would evaporate during the correction in 2011. You got any thoughts on that number? Wait, okay, so let me let me understand what you're saying. So, so it has this, gotten to at least 1.3. Correct. 18 How many times? times? 18 times, but sometimes it goes well above that. Yes. Right, okay. Um, and, and every single time it's gotten to at least 1.3, it has suffered a correction of what? Uh, a... a the S&P has suffered negative returns two to eight weeks later in 17 of them. In 17 of the 18. Full, my, my first thought, number one, uh, I mean, of course, it's going to be stacked in, in favor of – that's why we do this analysis. That's why the show exists. Sure. When you, have, when you have an imbalance in some kind of positioning dynamic, generally speaking, you get a reversion to the mean 
that's the point. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be some slope. I would say the degree, 17 out of 18, is that's not a big enough sample size for me, maybe to say that there's anything necessarily that it's, it's, it's that odd. That would make it feel like automatic. That gives you the feeling of, oh, I'll just short now. I don't need to stop because I'll just wait two to eight weeks from now and cover. <laughs> and, you know, it's guaranteed free money. Um, and, and if you could rinse and repeat that process, you've got a hedge fund. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I think probably if that sample got to 100 times, you know, over the next few years or something, we might see a little bit less of a percentage. But that's just a hunch. I mean, the data is what it is. So assuming that the data that you just cited is correct. The other thing that we don't know is um, the position how far of out of the money. Now, you probably you, – you, maybe there was – did Jason Geffert do a study on this? Um, no, he was just pointing out the last uh, few times it, it, it hit that level. I, I just found it to be an interesting number. But, again, when you talk about not having all the facts, and that's why, that's why it drives Scott nuts. I, I just like throwing out the tidbits there just to – Well, so you know, I'm, I'm curious, what, what about it drove him nuts? What, what, what did oh, he, he not like? He, he, he hates any time I throw out any sort of number about six of 14 times this has happened. Does he, think of, <laughs> does he have a problem with the concept of data mining? Because I do too. Yeah, yeah, do. Exactly. yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 I and totally agree with that's the problem I have too. Yeah. So and, and I, I'm not going to argue that point. I, I just like throwing it out for you or against you. I, I just like throwing it out there for a uh, discussion piece because I always think it's good to kind of kind of take a look back and be like, okay, peel back the onion and see what time's different. And, and I think when we get into good. the positioning side of things, I think we'll probably see something that we haven't seen very often in those other 18 weeks. No, but I think we have. Um, I think we have. Uh, you know, I think it's a good. It's a good process to say. Well, let's take a look at this. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's 100% valid and will perfectly play out with a continuing situation exactly like that. But then it brings up the question of: Is there something underneath this that's more than just uh, a, a coincidence and the product Correct. of strategic data mining? And the fact that it's not a really crazy sample. It's pretty much this cycle. You said since 2010, right? Um, it's since it 2000. So since 2000. Since 2000. Yeah. Oh, wow. Let's see, now, I'll tell you what, though. If you scroll back on that data point, look where it used to be. Look where it was in a real bubble. Yeah. You see that? Way up there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, 150 plus, like that's... Well, it's unfortunately, bubble, I bubble, can't but... get that chart on for the users, but we'll, no, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll right. post so, something so later way, this morning. When you, later and that's, that's, one of the things, that's one of the things that I do whenever I'm looking at a data point like that. Is I, I mean, we have the mother of all examples when you look at 99 and 2000. For whatever sentiment data you're looking at, that is a that is the that is the uh, unchallengeable example of a bubble, and one that had everybody, you know, across the board, completely sucked into. And so whenever you want to say, we're in a bubble now, you know, and and you say, well, it's because of sentiment data and positioning. You can see people are too exuberant. It's a bubble. Just compare it with 99 and 2000, and you'll see why under most situations you're wrong. And this is uh, this is this may be overweighted to calls right now. But it's not a situation that looks like in the vast sample of data, you know, it, it doesn't look like people are absurdly imbalanced in terms of their options trading recently. But it is, it does, yeah, it does, it does suggest that, let's call this one of those things we called last week, where we've got these sort of like um, kind of red flag leanings hints, but not necessarily something that gets you out of the long or starting to short. But it starts to, it puts another, if you imagine a Libra scale, it puts another quarter over onto one side of it that starts to tip things. That, that we're at the level where we have this data for the last 19 years or whatever, where 17 of 18 instances have led to a lower price two to eight weeks from now. That's a fact. You can't challenge that fact. So there we are. And it does, it is a valid uh, idea that this would be a relevant statistic. It's relevant to, to the market because it does reflect positioning and sentiment. So there is some unchallengeable sense in which there are people who are too aggressively leaning long right now. Whether that represents the most important subsample of people or not is uh, another idea. But there is that subgroup of people who are trading options right now, who are by and large imbalanced toward calls rather than puts. Well, um, and and over, let, over that time frame. And let's break into that because you had an interesting take on this, and it was certainly prevalent in this options speculation index, where a lot of this is being pushed by the ro 
robo put call ratio. It's the retail, yeah. Which is the, the retail. So you you want to break in and uh, I note why that potentially makes a difference one way or the other. Yeah, so I mean, here's what I here's where I stand right now. I, I stand. I think that there's two forces. There's um there's a tide and there's a a, a ripple, you know, or the, the waves and ripples. So there's a there's a current of money flowing into the market right now, and I think that that's going to have some legs to it. But I don't think that necessarily it's going to stop there from being short-term swings in both directions. And I think that when you start to get smaller money, and especially retail money, that is starting to turn to starting to flip into the mode and i think especially during earnings season of thinking hey estimates got too low i'm seeing all these stocks who are beating they're 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 gapping up and they're running afterwards and we've seen a number of those so far this earnings season it's something well you that's, and I a, talked that's about actually weeks ago. an interesting aspect that i wanted to talk to you about too with well, that, let's table that for a second around. yeah we'll yeah circle, we'll back, circle yeah. back to that so in the context of this, so we, we, we so to set the whole table for both of these conversations. Our theme on this show has been for the last six weeks, and I, I, Gavin, if you disagree with this, let me know. But it's been a situation where we've piled in oddly, uh, to uh, oddly for an uptrending market that's breaking out to new all-time highs, uh, a remarkable level of of exposure hedge, uh, exposure difficulties, uh, lack of exposure, um, and and hedging and too much cash on the sidelines or in money market funds or in really safe instruments like sovereign debt, um, despite what looks like uh, a market that's moving to the upside day after day after day. And, and it's been – the main thing we've been looking for is a situation where if the news starts to turn good, you've got vulnerability of all that money rushing in and accelerating things to the upside. And um, that's kind of relevant to both of these conversations. But there's this – other time frame where you do need to start thinking in terms of let's say you're a you're trading on a day trade time frame or a one to three day time frame and you're looking at really large cap stocks or you're looking at index instruments like Gavin and I both often do um, you do run into a little bit of a problem based on retail money right now that has started to I think clearly game the situation start to has started to latch on to an understanding that that reality may be slightly better than the market has been embracing and that there may be some easy money on the upside as stocks break out. And that that's all good as long as it works. But when you start to get everybody piled together on the call side, particularly when you I – mean, because when you look at something like the robo ratio, which is what I'm about to get to, retail only, buy to open, put call ratio, you're talking about small options trades. Um, and, and usually what that means in a situation when it's calls – because we're not talking about hedging here, most likely. When it's calls, what you're talking about is somebody with a small account who wants to get rich on a, on a short-term idea because they're going to move into a derivative instrument where they can lever up their capital quite a bit. And when you get a lot of people who don't have a lot of capital who are that certain of that kind of outcome and they start to school together, there starts to be a consensus of that kind of trading for small accounts participating in the options markets. It all starts to stack over on the calls. That usually is sort of inescapably at least a very short-term top. And my contention right now is that we're headed towards seeing that type of data by about Monday of next week. Well, and, you, you know, just taking a look at some of the other indicators there with the dumb money confidence number and the smart money confidence number, the spread between them has hit an extreme low level that we last saw in May, and that plays out again, I think, Brett, into that robo-lobo ratio. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so the danger with that instrument is, again, it, it, it is something that draws on technicals, too. So the way he – the dumb money, smart money – he does put in market momentum. And since the market's in an uptrend to breaking out to new all-time highs, that's the one I would kind of sub out. So we, 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 we take a look, generally speaking, at the pieces of that index that are, not, that are not including the market action. But, yeah, it, it, it is, I think, it is a combination of starting to see the calls uh, slip over and dominate the options trading along with the fact that the market has momentum. And that, you know, quite frankly, is usually a reasonable recipe for a situation where you're going to see some pullbacks. But here's the complicating problem. And to go back to what I said a few minutes ago, we've got this landscape that we've identified over the last six, six or seven weeks when we've done this show, where the number one priority is to bear witness to the fact that we've seen an all-time record amount of money flow into the bond market so far this year. And $150 billion come out of the stock market. 
but but Brett, be, before we get into this though, I I just want to circle back around to what we opened up the conversation with, and that's today's action. Would you see this reminiscent of a move? of some of those robo retailers kind of getting shaken out a little. You mean the shakeout before the rally? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it may be. I, I don't know. I, I think that when you get into a flag pattern, what I – what I so in my pattern construction for a kind of flag bull breakout is usually to look for um, 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 fractals, right? So you see, you see the kind of zigzag that this represents if you look at just like an – just even like an SPY hourly chart, you see like, uh, uh, you know, from the 12th down to the 18th of July, you see a move down, you pop back up to the 19th. And then you're what are you looking down. at here now? Just SPY, whatever. SPY, yes, okay. Yeah, 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 I, I just want to pull it up thing. on the chart. On, on the, uh, yeah, I mean, you got, a, you got like a zigzag pullback, and when you look at the daily chart, it's like a striped flag, you know. You, you see the stripes of the flag vertically with the, with the red candle, white candle, red candle, white candle, or for the S&P or whatever it is. You've got, you know, four days or so of pulling back in a, in a zigzagging kind of pullback. And then you start to move up and you get through the line that, that, that defines the highs of the A, B, C, you know, the origin of the A and the origin of the C, the tops, the two tops in that zigzag. You break up through that, and then inside of that, you then tend to get another little zigzag. And there's the reason why I ditched the first YM trade today, because I felt like there was a good chance that that's what we would see. We get another little pullback, bounce, pull back to a slightly deeper level. And that's actually, it's worked out really nicely for this explanation, because that's exactly what we got. But, but the point is that today's pattern has been a fractal of the pattern we've seen over the last five days. Do you see that? Yeah. Just pulling up the diamonds here on the daily. And I mean, in terms of the mechanism, in terms of like the Elliott formation, we've, we've seen a zigzag over the last four or five days, and then we have seen um, a, a zigzag today. You know, especially when you look at the YMs, which is one of the reasons I was I was looking at that. So so you get that you get that little bounce, you get that lower low, then you come back up, and then it's time to buy. And then we got the headline help, but it's a fractal. It, so it's a it's a little version inside of a big version of the same kind of dynamic. And I think a lot of times when you get these sort of flag pattern moves that are consolidations of bull markets, the better setups are to look for that fractal to play out, and it plays out. A lot of times on successively smaller time frames, which is just, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a dynamic kind of like you've got, obviously the whole pattern is built of some level of distribution. Some people who are along the market who've seen some gains who are reducing their exposure and other people, there's a bid coming up under the market. And then you've got traders in the middle gradually becoming more excited about the upside, getting sucked into bounces and then getting shaken out on, on, on the break of the lows. But there's still this faucet that's on right now. There's still money gradually flowing into the equities market, which is, you know, again, what we've been talking about. You, 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 and, and we'll get to this in a minute. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have seen a flows situation over the last six months. It's been nothing but out of stocks and into bonds. And suddenly, over the last couple of weeks, it's starting to go into stocks. And I don't think that's something that happens as a one-off, one-week thing. I think it's a process. And if that process is happening, it leads to uh, – it leads to a little greater conviction you can have in some of these pullbacks when they appear to stabilize that maybe they're starting to hit that bid. And, you know, you shake out the smaller money, but you run into that faucet. And I think that, that, that that's underlying the type of pattern we're seeing right now. Right. I, I mean, and, and basically, again, it goes to why we had this rollover, so a little bit of a shakeout. Now we're back here and see the NASDAQ moving back towards the session highs here, trying to press up. And uh, obviously, the diamonds have gone towards gone two session highs at this point. Uh, well, quick question on the diamonds, Brett, with the YM. I know there's only three components uh, making up about 8 to 9% of the mm -hmm. weighting in the uh, diamonds. But do you tend... To, because you, you'll jump around between the diamonds, the, the Qs, and the SPY a lot. Do you tend to focus on the diamonds at all a little bit more when they have a few earnings reports, or is it purely pattern-based? So one little check that I did earlier today when I took the first trade was I said, oh, Boeing doesn't look to be doing anything dramatically divergent from the rest of the market. But I want it to be something – yeah, I know, I know, yeah. and and you know, obviously there was a moment today. I don't know what it was where it got smacked and the volume leapt up. And I don't know what was getting passed around through chat rooms or something, but 
Um, there's a lot of stock-specific variables, obviously, going on with Boeing. And it's, it, it makes the YMs a lot less interesting to me. And over the last few months, I've traded them a lot less and focused more on NQs and ES um, because of that, because it's so heavily weighted toward Boeing. And Boeing has such you know, dynamic stock-specific variables that are really impacting the price, and it can completely take over. It can completely corrupt and distort the, the the pattern in the YMs relative to the other indices. Right, but everybody's um, wondering, you know, Boeing's got a eight po- or nine point three percent weighting, so ten yeah, percent of the index is nearly Boeing because of the price act. Because it's of the a price, ridiculous idea that price weight an index. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it is truly a ridiculous idea, but they they're not going to change it now. But anyways, <laughs> the, the other the other point was I I also believe that the kind of blue chip dividend paying really large cap stocks are what are going to work best in this leg of this bull market. And so Boeing notwithstanding, the idea that I'm exposed more to Coca-Cola and Bank of America and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is a good situation for leadership on the upside. I think that it's the opposite of the Russell in a lot of ways. You know, and, and I, I like that idea. I like the YMs as the instrument to use as the attack vehicle during a kind of Final leg of the bull market process, or at least whether or not that's actually the case, something that I think a lot of money is is pursuing right now, um, and and you know that I think we're going to have the breakout there first. It's already the closest to new highs. I think that's likely to happen. It, there's a lot of big blue chip, decent yielding plays in there, um, and with the ten year where it is, that's good too. There's all sorts of reasons to say that that's where government bond allocated equity index proper money will end up leaking back into the stock market. Um, in plays like Coke today, you know, in Bank right. of America and the breakout that we're seeing. And I think those are the places where that money is going to be like, okay, we'll get back into stocks, but it's going to be Coca-Cola and Bank of America. You know, it's not going to be Netflix and it's not going to be small caps. And I think that that kind of dynamic is starting to to happen a little bit right now. So it's, it's the reason I chose it. But, yeah, um, when I took the first uh, Dow position, it was with the idea that, you know, Boeing looked like it wasn't doing anything crazy today, intraday, you know, and, and it's it's obviously it bears on whether or not I hold this into tomorrow morning, the fact that they have earnings. But, you know, I may, I may not. We're going to see how it transitions. I wanted to break out some new highs first, and I'll we'll take another piece. Right. Now, so this basically, again, uh, so we saw that uh, shakeout get bought up, and now we're pushing towards session highs. And you talked a lot about this uh, just prior in prior weeks, too about the water flowing into the bathtub and just to kind of back up that we got some pretty good confirmation from the uh, flow show data from bank of america on friday too do you want to discuss some of the numbers that we're seeing there brett yeah i mean we saw well i mean we saw the idea that money is coming back into stocks now well, we've had the conversation over and over again well, what, what were you talking about specifically well i mean specifically i mean so we had 151 billion in redemptions on the equity fund side in the first half of 2019 but now Correct. we've seen 11 billion in inflows over the past six weeks and you can kind of look at that and um and six of it in the past week but yeah yeah and six just in the past week so five billion so it's, real it's, small it's, amp- it's accelerating it, it was yeah. that trickling in at the bathtub and then all of a sudden people realize okay it's going to take a little longer to fill up the bathtub at this rate so let's turn it the up the dam's starting more. to break a little bit exactly and we're seeing that action kind of play out here so um you, you know and a lot of it too if people are curious is focused on the u.s equity side which has actually seen inflows of 22 billion over the, that same period so while uh international uh equity funds were seeing 11 billion of outflows over the last six weeks the u.s has actually seen 22 billion of inflows over that same time frame so it certainly looks like they're picking the u.s as the winner at the moment uh, and, and say that I, again sorry sorry gav say that again so over that six week period we just talked about 11 billion in equity inflows over that time frame the u.s equity funds have actually gotten 22 billion of that inflow in. so um there's actually still been over that time frame uh, a little bit of a small outflow in some of the international equity funds yeah but the, so it's been very focused and biased on the u.s this recent inflow from equities certainly uh, right. one would have to think of the um change in the central bank over that time but again yes. it, it, it builds into two what you're talking about with that bathwater slowly starting to fill up, right? Well, I mean, it's 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 
you've got it's been so it's been so one-sided it's been so absurdly one-sided and it's been so speculatively one-sided like i mean there's a way to look at the type of money flows we've seen this year as a big giant bet because it doesn't it doesn't match up with the price action it's just it's it's this idea that it's not safe to be at equities i mean there are other ways to there are other ways to to try to understand what's been happening but you could easily look at it like a lot of people deciding that just without evidence of either a bear market or a recession that there's a preponderance of opinion that those are coming and that that would account for why there's been such a dramatic move to safety despite a market that's held up very well and uh, you know very few clear economic indications of much softness and yet a Fed that's still moving in the direction of easing like it should be something where people are just going purely by the data purely by a quantitative system that they're not moving out of stocks and into bonds during the first six months of this year but they have been so there's kind of this bet that's been consensus in 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 and we, we talked about it last week that even the Ameritrade move index is still uh, uh, kind of showing you know it was showing that retailers were on the same bet we know professional money's been on the same bet and yet at the same time you got a situation where uh, we we've got the have your cake and eat it too kind of fed situation and the market is moving to new all-time highs and it's in an uptrend and it just it doesn't make a lot of terrific sense when you just look at the quantitative elements of the equation that we've seen those sorts of money flows so yeah I mean the the, the fact that I, I guess our thesis has been that at, at a certain point that bet is going to start to be closed out in a manner of speaking which means that we're going to start to see inflows into equities one thing we didn't see, though, I will point out, is that we did not see actual outflows from bonds. No, there's which is twelve billion in a bond, six point two. Yeah, billion which is well. I mean, let's, let's even after that, we had a terrible auction, right? When you look at the thirty-year on, I think it was the the eleventh of July, we had an awful all thirty-year the, auction. I mean, and I think that the, the uh, two and the uh, ten years were a l little bit uh, rough too. No, two was I thought kind of eh, middling. Yeah. Um I don't I don't have an opinion on the 10 year but I know the 30 year was just terrible. Okay, well let, let, let's circle back to that in a second cuz there's two more things that I want to throw at you Brett for um for this and the bond flow data is going to be how I want to cap this off and throw a couple of scenarios at you cuz we are what um today's the 22nd 23rd um, so we, we are getting close to that Fed meeting, so I, wa I want to get some early thoughts from you going into that. But um, we, we've covered pretty uh, much uh, our bullish thesis on the uh, flowing in of data here um, and uh, how the sediment data is kind of lined up with that. One, one thing that I wanted to throw in, because I guess the question is, is this a false breakout? And certainly, you know, some of the option activity could uh, – flow into that potentially I suppose there was another uh, thing that I was seeing that I would be curious to get your mind on so and that was buying climaxes in S&P 500 stocks and basically yeah what that means uh, is a, cl a climax occurs when the stock pushes above a 52 week high during the week and then reverses uh, into the close of the week below the prior week's close uh, the basic thesis is that's a sign of tired buyers. Now, obviously, we just went through the flow data that would suggest that's not the case, but there were 70 incidences of buying climaxes in the S&P last week, which was the most since January of 2018, which is, of course, right before we had that rollover. How would you um, look at that data? I know Scott's been uh, kind of teeing up uh, on uh, a couple of shorts on that. I know the co the Coke one didn't work out too well, but uh, he got he had some success with Microsoft last week and has been kind of looking at this pattern playing out too. Do you got any thoughts on the buying climaxes? Yeah, I do. And I think that it's it's like everything that we talk about, the, the thesis statement of doing this show is to support the idea that there's another dimension to reality. There's, so if you imagine like a, a 2D picture of something, and then you, let's say you have some, some good uh, piece of software that can turn a 2D picture into a three-dimensional picture, right? So you see a face, and then it turns to the side, and it's got a head and all sorts of stuff. Like there, the technical analysis, particularly a pattern like that, and even breadth-based, that, that's, that's a price action 
piece of analysis, price and volume, right? It, and and it has different, it has a different outcome distribution in different sentiment data environments. So there's a the, the extra dimension is to take a look at the the context in terms of sentiment and positioning, and in different sentiment and positioning landscapes, that pattern is going to have very different outcomes, based on you know where people are vulnerable. And and if you have a situation like we saw. Golden situation again. I like this example so much for so many things. Is the end of January of 2018. So right after the 2017 run, and right after the tax reform bill was signed, and then we had that really strong parabolic kind of January move. We had a sentiment backdrop that was just incredibly slanted toward that kind of 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 setup as a, just an incredible setup because we know we've already gotten everybody leaning way too hard in the idea that there's just a there's just no risk to the market whatsoever now that we not only have better growth but we've also got fiscal stimulus coming through the in the form of the tax reform bill which was weighted toward uh, enabling uh, uh, corporations to spend more and it it you know it just it set up this golden short opportunity even though that wasn't the top it was a top and it was a dramatic top we saw a a, a, a veritable market crash several days later and it was because we were so vulnerable to that we had such a preponderance of different indicators showing that people were in 99th percentile kind of uh, 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 leaning vulnerable kind of positions you know there were so many people so on the same side of the market that when you then in that type of context you see buying climaxes everywhere it opens a trap door below the market. And at the other end of the spectrum, I believe, would be a situation where you've just seen $150 billion flow out of stocks before this. And you have a, a series of weeks where you have data that doesn't match up, where you have people who are being overly cautious toward the market despite a strong market and despite the Fed moving into easing mode and despite, 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 despite. So I think that right now, We've got some shorter term red flags, but these sorts of patterns can lead to, in my opinion, and I don't I don't hold the book of truth and I can change my opinion at any time. I reserve that right. I could post in 10 minutes and say I disagree with what I just said because that's how I operate. Uh, honestly, that I, I think I, – I, I, Who has it said that uh, I didn't change, the market changed or something? Well, it, well, I mean I definitely, definitely support that philosophy. Like if you get married to – even views that you feel very strongly about, you can suddenly see one tiny piece of evidence that changes everything about how you see things. I've had that experience more times than I can count, where I'm, I've got a definite idea about something, and I see a, a new piece of data that comes in, and suddenly I'm living in a different universe. And I realize it right away, and I'm like, oh, man, you cannot fight for your previous views when you start to see suddenly there's this voice that you're hearing inside you that says that no, you're wrong. You need to shift your position. So I'll shift my position pretty quickly. But right now, what I believe is the case is this is the type of environment that could lead to technical patterns that are seemingly bearish in terms of looking like a technical top, but that could pull back just a little bit, get everybody suddenly could see the robo ratio flip on a dime, you know, to the opposite side of the spectrum in 48 hours, and then we grind back up and squeeze. I think it's that kind of situation. We could see a big doji top, a big a bar that where the market rallies like crazy during the morning, sells off like crazy during the afternoon, leaves a giant tail up there. We gap down the next day and rally right up through the tail. And I think we could see patterns like that right now because I believe people have malpositioned themselves out of the market in a situation where they're going to have to confront the fact that it's possible that they have misjudged the end of the cycle. And that's going to lead me to my final uh, thought to throw at you here, Brett, and, and not just some thoughts on a potential trade setup. Um, with that in mind, just taking a quick peek at the markets, we got the diamond stretching to the highs of the day. You're still long in there, right? Yes, I am. Very nice. Um, NASDAQ, for its part, seeing a little bit of uh, – resistance here same with the s p but not much but diamonds definitely outpacing the group right now at the moment okay so now i don't want to oversimplify this because within the next week before this we got pmi data we've got the ecb we've got a ton of big earners out and everything but we we are starting to get close to that july 31 fed decision and uh this is what i want to postulate as possibly a perfect example of where we could get 
a little bit of a shakeout like we're talking about here and uh, you know the type of event that would cause more broad based selling potentially and that's if we got a hawkish um, a, a hawkish cut right which would be we get to 25 basis point but then we see Rosengren descent, which is more than likely, um, and we see commentary from Powell saying, okay, we got the cut in, we think we redid the December mistake, we're probably going to be back to patient for a little bit just to see how the market, because the coming data has been getting a little bit more positive. Um, and I'm, I'm just throwing out this thesis. Uh, right. we talk, one version of reality. One version of reality. So, in that scenario, it would not surprise me, especially if we got a rally up into it, especially if the ECB um, perhaps was dovish, but not as dovish as some people thought, but it still led to an inflow of money going in. And that is kind of taking a look at uh, the bond market and what could release the uh, waters to get us um, back into the uh, you know, to get that money flowing from bonds into equities. And I think that would be the key because when we look at equity or when we look at the bond inflow, we've talked a lot about it. And if anybody's curious, bond inflow for 2019 so far to date has been $455 billion according to the Bank of America uh, uh, flow, flow Show Survey. I think it's on pace for, isn't it? On, it's on pace for an annualized it's, level. It, it's on pace for on an annualized level. Sorry, yes. Which would be the most ever. Which would be the most ever because it would compare to $1.7 trillion in inflows over the past 10 years. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's exponentially crazy. more inflow, um, which leads me to the question, Brett. Say we got this and all of a sudden – we saw a big dip in uh, the, in bond yields, uh, just on the headline on the rate cut. But then all of a sudden we started seeing the bonds just tank and the yields going higher. Mm -hmm. And at the point, equities would likely tank too. Um, you'd probably see some selling. And I don't gold. know about that. Uh, well, not tank, not tank, but a pullback. I think would be a fair. And, and th this is the point where I'm going to where I'm trying to get to. Um, with okay. the shakeout is this is how I kind of see things playing out over this time frame. And again, okay. there's PMI data, there's ECB, there's a ton of earnings. There's a lot to factor in here. Uh, there'll be the Q2 GDP number, but that'll be afterwards, um, after the or, or the Fed. Uh, actually, no, that will be before yeah, the before. Fed meets. So um, doesn't so, matter, but yeah, it doesn't matter. It's at the end of this week. It's this Friday. My my bad. So anyway, so we got a lot of information to come before we get to the Fed meeting that could change this all. The idea being this, do you have any sort of interest in a shortened bonds that would lead to the eventual bubbling up and the overflowing of the bathtub and the rubber ducky running out of the bathtub in equities? Do you have any interest in that sort of a trade? Is that something that is on your radar over the next week or so? So um, I like to pursue a process where the main thing that makes me want to do something is that I see something showing me personality characteristics that are in line with that. So I think that I can scenario build just like you have there and see a reason to have a, a conceptual bias to be open to that. But I would need to see the type of activity in that market that I recognize as totally independent from, from theoretical ideas about putting macro puzzle pieces together, just, just simply getting a sense of how the personality of that market right now in terms of how the patterns are playing out relative to exogenous catalysts and how the orders appear to feel and, 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 you know, just my sense of other markets and how they feel. And if that fits in an inner market sense, I would need to feel like that makes sense to me. And then secondary to that would be coming up with a, 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 a more elaborate macro rationale that fits that. Um, so I can see, and, and certainly there's the positioning dynamic. It's already there. There's already a nonsensical money flow into bonds unless we're in recession in a few months. Nonsensical. Um, and, and, but we may be. But there is, there is a, a, there's a good chance that that's not the case, in which case it's a nonsensical amount of money. Um, the, the, that would support the idea that 
there's a trade there. And particularly, maybe if we blow off on something else, I kind of like that a little bit more than the scenario you outlined. Something along the lines of uh, of an upside blow off to the bond market on something that's particularly great news for the bond market. Well, well the, and and that was kind of my one thing in terms of getting the headline bots just running on the twenty five basis point cut type thing. I know that's probably priced in right now, so perhaps. Well, how about this? Be, or what if we got the fifty basis? What if we got the twenty five basis points, but with a a a a accompanying language and maybe follow up Fed speak that highlights the uh, tremendous likelihood of uh, a cut in September, a cut in December, a cut next March, you know, and that they want to run. They so maybe maybe that kind of scenario that this is an easing cycle this is not a one-off thing, and the bond market rallies on that, suspecting that the you know the Fed has got a sense to this. Um, and then maybe fades way back off, and then you start to realize a new around the next around the corner, looking at the world, the next world to come into existence is a world in which the Fed is really just trying to run inflation hot, and you get a big steepener trade that emerges out of that blow off move. I think that that kind of fits to me pretty well. That you would be looking at a Fed that's just hell bent, regardless of anything else, on getting inflation to two point four percent, and steepening the yield curve like crazy right now because that's what it believes needs to be the case to give it room to do to 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 to, to avoid the japanization of the united states uh no matter where equities are at no matter where anything is at and we're at 1.6 or 1.7 inflation right now and they want to get significantly higher than that and they're you know really dead set on that the, the Powell that Fed is is taking that on as a mission. I I, um, I would note just uh, with regards to that that we we're not getting an update to projections at all or anything along those lines. So I know that. It, it, I know that. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that you're implying that. I'm just letting the right. subs know just to make for sure everybody else. Yeah. We're not so there's get not going to be a, my point being there's not going to be a clear dot plot right. that would show you know those cuts coming. Sure. This is this is yeah. This is atypical for a move in policy to come in a meeting without all the other stuff. Right. But it's been signaled ahead, so the move really happened last meeting in a manner of speaking, and you already saw the downgrade to inflation expectations. And I wonder if we got you know if we, if they're really gonna because this is coming in what is it amounts to almost like an intermediate cut, and th that may mean that there's a more concerted effort to get the foot soldiers out explaining, get the Wall Street Journal article out, whatever it is to give a give some help to people to to already start preparing for where this is headed. And, and, and I think the markets are still on a fence between whether this is an insurance cut or an easing cycle with an agenda. And I, and I suppose if I were to paint the perfect picture for a bond short, it would probably be the idea that this turns out to be the more dramatic, more concerted effort to, to remove the risk of Japanization, to be thinking about what the next 10 years brings. And, and to really give themselves some room and to do everything they can when there's very, very little inflation risk, forgetting about where equities are, forgetting about all sorts of stuff, but just saying, here's an inflation situation, this thing's starting to peel off, we cannot let this go to 0.9% and 0.7% and end up locked in a two-decade problem. We're going to need to fire this thing up and, and to really just – make a concerted effort to stimulate right now like crazy, do whatever they can to push so they can run it hot, leave it hot, change the, the landscape of expectations, and then have a lot of policy room to work with when things roll over inevitably. And I, there's that philosophy out there that that's what needs to happen right now. I don't know whether or not they're going to have the, the – uh, 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 they're going to they're gonna seize the moment and make that happen. Whether or not they judge that to be the right thing to happen, there's certainly voices on the Fed, like maybe a Williams who sees that kind of idea, um, and 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 there's there's obviously yeah, a, lot there's a lot of argument about against price, that. If there's a lot of talk about price targeting, right? Yeah, I mean, and it may be it may be right on the money. I don't know, but it, it depends on what philosophy they choose to pick up, and we don't know where they're at. But they're going to do some kind of job, and maybe they just you know played safe one way or the other or hit the middle ground and and we don't see anything like that but i think the bond short would really be the idea of a lot of cuts coming and so the initial suppression of the curve as a whole and then the realization that a big steepener is coming and then you see something like the the zb just tank and i think that you could blow it off and, and reverse it because you know how much more money is going to come into a situation where everybody's already in bonds they don't have enough exposure to stocks and we're going to see a steepener trade 
And I think that that would be the way you could just see this big opportunity short at the long end of the curve in the futures. But I don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, if I were to paint an ideal unfolding of events, I guess I, I would paint it that way because we've already got all the money flows stuck in there. Okay. All right. Well, um, there's one feedback question uh, that we could get to in a second here, but just for clarification. But um, you got anything else that you want to uh, discuss here? I think we hit a bunch of key topics so far. But and, no, and, I think uh, I think we've done a yeah. I think we've I think we've pretty much hit. Okay. Points. Now I just want to make sure that we get clarification on this because I don't think this is what you're saying. But uh, chart, not sure if I heard you correctly, but you think market might might hit a top by this Monday. Is that right? Okay, so I'll say that the, the, the answer to that question has to do with defining the article. Is it a uh or the? And it's not the, but maybe a. Uh. So a yeah, top, he uh, said the hit top. The top. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, we could see a shortable opportunity. I don't know, Monday, maybe Tuesday. I think that what, what, I, what I think is going to happen is that we're going to get a new round of data on something like the robo ratio on Saturday, and I think we're going to see an extreme bull position on Saturday. I think we're going to see new highs in the market this week. I think we maybe close the new highs this week. I, I think that there's some uncertainty. So look at something like the the, the Mueller testimony, right, in, in the House tomorrow. I, I think that that is a, a source of uncertainty, and I think that it really has no basis to be one. And I think that people are gradually going to find out that he's the – He's the, the, let's say he's the vastly superior player in the room in terms of being strategic with language, probably one of the preternaturally gifted people on the planet in terms of deposition and testimony, and he's going to be up against people who are trying to get out of him something that he's never going to give up, and he's going to be, again, preternaturally gifted at not giving that up, and he's already basically explained his goal is to accept, exit the spotlight. And, and let the written report serve as the final word. And that his job in history is not to interpret those facts, it was to gather them. And I think that anybody who's looking for anything else from him is not going to get it. And at the same time, I think that the people who are going to be talking to him in the House are don't really want to impeach, but they want to make a good show for people who don't understand the impeachment process, who are voters of theirs. To kind of look like they're being tough, they're really trying to take it to Trump, but nobody wants this to go to the Senate where it's going to become a double-edged sword that's much sharper pointed away from Trump than it is toward him. And and Robert Mueller doesn't want to be involved in that process in the first place. He's already done his job, and he's explained that he doesn't want to be involved in the interpretation of the facts, just the gathering of them. And he's already done that. And again, I think that in a setting where there's going to be language used to try to extract information, I think he's going to be the ringer by far. So I think the idea that there's going to be some kind of stunning uh, uh, event based on that, is not going to be something that plays out. Maybe I'll be wrong about that, but it seems to me like there's probably yeah. another reason why the market takes off again is just because there's not uh, uncertainty there. I don't think the market would necessarily move higher on the idea of we're headed toward an impeachment hearing. Regardless of your political views, I think that that's a lot of turmoil and division and not one that necessarily changes the political landscape at all. Right. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I, I think the Mueller uh, thing's going to end up being a big nothing burger personally, but, um, you know, we'll see. And so it's there's the... money on the sidelines in front of it. So let's say yeah. what you just said is true. Then as people start to realize that, then we get the further breakout. Right. Right. So I think that then and you've also got we're headed right, but, toward. But then we also have we go Amazon. Deal. We got Amazon and Google on Thursday. So that could play in. Pretty um, low expectations, though, probably. Right. Maybe uh, not. You know better than yeah, I do. Yeah, Google definitely, Amazon probably not as much. I, 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 the funny thing is I think Netflix has rattled some of the, the expectations around the Fang names, but it's so company-specific for Netflix, you know? So company-specific, yeah, right. But, but I mean, yeah, but yeah. there is the thought process of, well, you know, just taking money out of there and looking for it. And Google's is coming off a pretty poor quarter. Now, they usually don't put back-to-back -back quarters facebook of course a ton of regulatory issues still surrounding that and um amazon you know that they, they had a little bit of a sloppy uh quarter last quarter two with the slowdown in revs so there are a few things out there um but i mean i think we've been seeing some of the rotation out of the fang names into other names as it is anyway so yeah. well but we've got light and mnuchin headed back to shanghai yeah 
Yeah, well, it's good. So we got that coming at us, and uh, obviously <laughs> that's going to solve every problem like in an hour. Uh, so course. we don't have to worry about that anymore. So either way, there's there's a context that I think is going to lead to uh, some evolution toward the possibility of a short-term, shortable, possible shortable um, little right. kind of opportunity early next week. We'll, we'll see. I could be wrong. Leading the data could shift the, the other way. Leading in and through the FOMC, basically. I think maybe because yeah. there is that there's that huge uncertainty about is this that you know is it's the same thing we talked about with the bond idea is this right. is this headed toward being you know we're one off we're done everything's fine we took care of that December mistake and now we're just going to sit there and, and and or is it we've got a really strong agenda to make sure that we get inflation well back above two percent and keep it there for a while because we've got this idea about the problem that's looming that most people don't see and we're going to do our job. Yeah, we don't know which of this is going to be. So there, yeah, there's that uncertainty. Okay, good stuff. All right, Brett. Well, uh, I figure we'll uh, cut it off there, and uh, we got an interesting couple of days in front of us before we meet again, and uh, we'll be doing a lot with the Fed previews at that point in time too. So, um, any th- any parting shots at this point, or shall we call it a call it a wrap session here? Yeah, I mean, a little parting shot summarize. So we've been talking for the last two months on the show about a, a strange imbalance where we've seen a tremendous amount of money move out of the stock market and into the bond market for basically the entire year, except for the last few weeks and really the last week. And we've been looking for that dam to break as we start to see the possibility that people start to realize they're underexposed to a stock market that's breaking out to new all-time highs as the Fed cuts. And, uh, you know, we may be starting to see that damn break, and I doubt that that damn breaking is going to be a one-week event, that it's going to be a process, and that process is going to be filled with short-term pops and short-term drops, but a gradual grind higher, likely, but, you know, we may see the action stop confirming that kind of viewpoint, but until it does, I think it's a problem, once again, to make your life as a trader about trying to pick the top of this market. It's easier money right now on the long side because we've started to see the, the, the faucet turn back on in that bathtub and the rubber ducky start to move back up. Right. Okay. And uh, before you leave, Fred, any parting shots on your YM long plans for holding it overnight? Anything along those lines? I haven't made up my mind, but I definitely want to see – I, yeah, I've got my mind set on uh, a splash above uh, 27400 before I do anything else with it in terms of taking profits. Okay, so well, we'll, we'll, be look, we'll be looking for an update into the close. Brett, as always, pleasure talking to you. It's been a lot of fun the last hour, and I uh, look forward to kind of watching things play out here and see if we are on tip or not. You got it. Okay, thanks, Jeff. All right, take care.